Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast. Get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome back William Lines. He's a urologist. His Kevin MD article today is titled From Physician to Survivor, My Inspiring Journey Through Burnout, Mental Illness, and Triumph. William, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Kevin. Thank you for inviting me back. So, William, you've been on multiple times. For those interested in hearing more about his story, go to kevinnimity.com slash podcast. Upper right-hand corner, there's a search bar. Search for William's name and to hear his story. So let's get straight into your most recent Kevin MD article. So tell us how this came together. Well, you know, I'm a physician, a urologist, but I'm also a mental health survivor of physician burnout and, and suicide. And I practiced urology from 1987 to 2003. About the midpoint of that practice, I had a couple of two catastrophic medical surgical problems, one being septic shock episode and the other being a snowboarding accident with facial fractures. And when I went back to work, I didn't feel good. I had real problem with depression. I found out that I was a bipolar affective mood disorder. And because of that and physician burnout, I really started a downward spiral mm. and uh, ended up with suicidal ideation and three attempted suicides. Now, the theme of what I'm talking about today is really the shame that I felt associated with my mental mm. illness during my practice. And I have pulled out what I call three episodes of shame and to talk about, uh, there were many times that I felt very shameful about my behavior, but these are sort of uh, uh, real situations. The first was I, I had septic shock in 1998 and I was out of work for 10 months. When I was about ready to go back to work, I had to go to the physician who was writing my off work orders. And he wanted me to return to work, let's say in May of 1999. And I told him I wasn't ready. And I remember a real change in his demeanor. He was disgusted with me. It was obvious. And I, I felt really bad about that. But what really made me feel bad is I, I hand carried my paper to, we had paper charts at that time. And I hand carried my chart to my next appointment. And he had written in the medical record, Dr. Lines must return to work without excuses. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was, I thought, my friend. He was a fellow partner in Kaiser Permanente. He had been taking care of me along with uh, so many other physicians. And uh, I was just really destroyed. I was, I was so upset. I was so hurt. And so that is my first, uh, I call a milestone of shame. Mm -hmm. And I remember it to, to this day. The second was my first suicide attempt. I have three of them. The first was around the time of that gentleman's comments, and it really had something to do with it, but it was just a an, an overdose that I took and I, I hit it. Nobody really knew about it. I went back to work. But uh, a year, year and a half later, after doing so poorly and feeling so bad about myself, I began thinking about suicide, and I attempted a very serious suicide attempt. I went to a hotel, and I proceeded to take a massive overdose, and when they found me, I was comatose, so I had to be intubated because of respiratory failure. My family was called in, and they were told that I wasn't going to survive. I obviously did survive. I ended up in a locked psychiatric unit, had to begin having electroconvulsant therapies. And really, my story at that point was out of the bag. Uh, everybody knew that I was suicidal and had attempted suicide. For some reason, you, you might say it's a crazy reason, but you have to realize I was only 49 at the time. I had a three boys that I was raising, and, and, and I loved medicine, and I, I thought that if I went back to work that I, I, I could have a successful urologic practice. And so I had to go in front of the hospital wellness committee and plead my case. And I remember it as just a very, very uncomfortable, shameful period of time, several hours that we met with them. And I remember that I really felt that I was begging and cajoling them into letting me practice medicine. So that is my second milestone of shame, something that I'll always remember. It was, you know, very, very meaningful to me. My third milestone of shame, I went back to work after this second suicide attempt, and I had the same thing. 
mental issues with depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, difficulty with long surgeries, call bothered me tremendously. And I, I decided to end my life again. And uh, this time was again, a very serious uh, attempt. I went to my office on a weekend, uh, planning to commit suicide. And I can remember just briefly going in my office that morning and it, it was cold inside. And I remember looking at my reflection in my medical school diploma and thinking how, how disgusted I was about, about my behavior and my, my intentions. I proceeded to lacerate my wrist and I fell into a deep sleep. I lost maybe four units of blood on the floor of my office. When I woke up, though, I, I knew that I wasn't going to die. And so I had to call the hospital operator. And again, this is now the hospital that I had practiced urology for 16 years. And I had to call them and tell them the situation and then be admitted to the hospital. In my illness, I, I imagined that everybody in the hospital knew and, and were judging me from the cafeteria cook to the hospital operator, and of course, to my physician colleagues. And it, it was, again, extremely shameful. And uh, it, it ended up that I decided that in order to save my life, I would have to I would have to quit and retire from medicine. And I've been retired since 2003. So these are three major points in my urologic practice and practice of medicine, where because of my mental illness and physician burnout, I felt tremendous shame. And I think, you know, we may we talk about it, but shame is endemic in mental illness, and it's, it's really counterproductive to, to getting back and being well. So let's get back to that first episode where a physician whom you thought was your friend, a colleague, said that you had to go back to work without excuses and really exacerbated that shame. Why do you think that physician reacted that way? I don't think he understood the depth, the problems that I was having. He had been integral in the clinical treatment of my septic shock for quite a while. You know, what would happen is that when I went out of the country, when I came back, I was sick. I ended up going to the ICU with a septic shock and was on a ventilator for four weeks and in the hospital, in the ICU for six weeks and 40 pound weight loss, tracheostomy, the whole, the whole bit. And he was involved in a certain piece of that treatment. He did not appreciate the depth of mental anguish that something like that does to you. I'm real big about the the reality of a so-called ICU psychosis. And I don't think that treating physicians really understand the depth, the problems that that, you know, that does to you. And so I think I think his problem was he just he didn't appreciate it. He thought that I was really faking, I guess, and just needed to get work uh, back to work that maybe I I just was trying to to get out of work. So you mentioned that shame is a hallmark of a lot of mental illnesses. Now that you've been on that side, what are some things that the medical institution can do better to reduce that shame that is often associated? I think it's a it's it's a real problem. It's sort of inherent in mental illness. I, I wrote an essay for you called The Invisibility of Mental Illness, which basically says that there aren't any measurable signs of mental illness. There are only symptoms. And so the patient always thinks that the person that they're being treated by doesn't really understand or believe that they have these problems. So I think it's inherent in mental illness, and it's a real problem. I think people understand you better than you think. Since I I wrote an article in 2017 called The Last Day. It was published in the Internals of Internal Medicine. It is the first time that I really came out to the medical community about my mental illness and suicidal behavior. And what I've found is that, that without exception, people accept me and they, they're proud of me. They thank me. They tell me about 
their own struggles and problems. So I, I think in terms of what the medical profession needs to do is be more open, reflective on their problems. And the physician who is in that situation needs to open up because it is cathartic. It is, it is a therapeutic to tell your colleagues that you're having problems. Now, how did you overcome these episodes of shame? It's been a long time since I retired. When I retired, I, I was destroyed. Uh, I became a medical hermit, I call myself. I, I withdrew from the medical profession. Yeah, I didn't practice medicine, but I could have gone to meetings. I could have interacted with my colleagues, but I absolutely did not. I was afraid to go to my own medical appointments. I coped with it by by a fellow physician said, you should write something and have it published. And in 2017, like I said, I did that. And since then, you know, I've been totally open and have have spoken to people and told them that I'm a suicide attempt survivor, that I have mental illness and bipolar disease and physician burnout history. And it's just been like night and day in terms of relief. My self-image is, is repaired to some extent. I feel like I'm a physician again. And so that's what I did is, but, but it took a long time. I mean, it took me, you know, 16 years, I think it is of being shameful and, and hiding. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, I, I came out and, and it's been, it's been a relief. Now for those physicians today who may be going through a lot of mental illness, behavioral health issues, and even today there's going to be some facet of shame that may be involved. Do you have any piece of advice that you could share with these physicians who may not know where to turn? Well, first of all, they're not alone. Our profession has a real problem. You know, everybody knows the number of 400 suicides, physician suicides per year. And that sounds like a lot. It's a Boeing 7747 or it's two medical school classes. But if you think about it, for every one completed suicide, the literature says that we have somewhere between 20 to 100 attempted suicides. Hmm. So if we take the number 50 and we multiply 50 times 400, we come up with a number of 20,000 suicide attempts per year in the United States. There's only about 800,000 physicians in the United States, and that amounts to 2.5%. So 2.5% of all physicians in the United States attempt suicide every year. So the first thing I would say is that you are not alone. And in terms of things that that, that you can do, I think reaching out to others is so key. I I think understanding that you're not alone. And and then when you open up, you're met with acceptance. I think that's a basic plan that that I would propose to individuals like this. And my final question, William, tell us some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. I think that, again, as I as I just chronicled, the, the medical profession has a real problem with physician burnout, mental illness, and suicidal behavior. I think that the root cause of it is a deterioration of the physician-patient relationship. And I think that there are many examples of that everywhere. And I think until we repair that relationship, we're going to continue to have really a sick profession. Shame is what we are talking about. It's part of mental illness. I don't really know how to make it go away except for the shameful person to realize that they're not alone. William, thank you again for coming back on the show and sharing your story, time, and insight. Thank you, Kevin.